of starvation, one by one, maybe dozens in all, unless something changes at Guantanamo Bay. The detainees there are now in the 80th day of their hunger strike, with at least 97, more than half of those imprisoned, taking part in the protest. Five of those participating have been hospitalized. Nineteen are being force-fed. And if that sounds at all benign to you, consider one former detainee describing on this program exactly what that experience is like. When the nurse uh, comes, uh, they try for five to ten minutes in, on, on this side of uh, the nose, and then they hit the bone. And, uh, I mean, uh, and you tell me, was this a torture or not? More than a decade after the Bush administration began using the military base for indefinite detention of individuals they dubbed enemy combatants, the peaceful protest of a hunger strike is reminding the world, or trying to remind the world, that 166 detainees are still being held at Guantanamo, most never having been charged with anything. In an op-ed in the New York Times, Yemeni detainee Naji al Hassan Makbil explained his refusal to eat in stark terms. He says, I have been on a hunger strike since February 10th and have lost well over 30 pounds. I will not eat until they restore my dignity. I've been detained at Guantanamo for 11 years and three months. I have never been charged with any crime. I have never received a trial. On Thursday, Senator Dianne Feinstein called on the Obama administration to consider repatriating the 56 Yemenis who have been approved for transfer out of Guantanamo, but who remain stuck at the base. President Obama halted their transfer after the Yemeni branch of al-Qaeda was tied to the attempted 2009 bombing of a Detroit-bound airplane. Obama's hold on transferring these detainees is just one of the steps the president has taken in recent years that make transferring detainees out of the prison more difficult. He tried unsuccessfully to close the facility at the beginning of his president presidency, but he was rebuffed by Congress back then. The long history and uncertain future of Guantanamo was underscored in testimony last month to Congress by General John Kelly, who oversees Guantanamo as a head of the U.S. Southern Command. I'm assuming Guantanamo will be closed someday, uh, but if, if we look into the past 11 years, it was supposed to be temporary. Who knows where it's going? To help answer that question, I want to bring in Michelle Ringette. She is the chief of campaigns at Amnesty International. And John Neffel, he's the co-host of Radio Dispatch and contributor to The Nation magazine and RollingStone.com. Um, I think just to set this up, we have a, a, a pie chart that sort of that, that looks at who those 166 detainees are, sort of how they are classified by the government. And I, I know Amnesty doesn't recognize this classification. We'll get to that in a minute. But, but for the sake of just explaining this a little bit, according to the, uh, the government, you've got 86 uh, who are approved for transfer, and they're just they're stuck there right now. Uh, 46 who are, are in an uh, indefinite detention. Basically, um, it's, been, it's been deemed that they, they need to be held, but they can't be tried can't be put on trial in a military uh, a tribunal. They can't be tried in courts. That's the determination of the government. Um, others, you see, they're subject to active investigations, and, and, and three are convicted. So we're sort of in this stalemate. And, um, you know, it, 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 I think the, the, the question that, that comes to my mind is, and we talked about this a little bit in the last segment, we were talking about empathy, you know, the, the idea of having empathy for people who maybe commit acts of terrorism or, or you know, uh, uh, suspected of it. Um, it. You know, it seems to me that if you're going to have any movement on this, there needs to be some empathy on the part of the public for the people that are detained there. And, of course, I think the public's instinct when they hear about Guantanamo is, these are terrorists, these are dangerous people. I don't want to, I don't want them getting out and and I just wonder how you can kind of how you get around that politically. Well, I think one thing you really have to do is imagine that you're just walking down the street and then suddenly you're grabbed maybe by a foreign government or in many cases by perhaps a bounty hunter paid $5,000 to deliver you to a foreign government. Then suddenly you end up far from home with no access to lawyers, with no ability to try your case in a fair way. Um, and what you're looking at is what we've done with Guantanamo. It's been 11 years now and most of these men have never been charged and they certainly haven't received fair trials. And we are now in a place where we own it. And I know that like, I don't want to have to explain to my six-year-old son why he sees images of men in orange jumpsuits and black head bags because uh, Amnesty often goes out and we try to make sure that we show people the images and the visuals of what it looks like to actually have these prisoners. Um, but it's a real stark reminder as you start, try to explain what we're doing. These are conditions that 
people associate with North Korea or China. And people have to recognize this is something the U.S. government is doing, and we have to resolve it now. Well, what, so what is what is the solution? Because you have, when we say, to be clear on the terminology, we talk about um, detainees being approved for transfer. We're not always talking about them being just released. We're talking maybe about going into custody in another country or going to another country where they're being monitored you know, by the government, their activities being monitored, where there's still some degree of suspicion or some degree of, you know, you know, we think these people are, are a risk, you know, going forward. Um, some, you know, that the government is detaining and is basically saying, we are convinced these people had leadership roles in al-Qaeda. These are people who had leadership roles in the Taliban. We do not have evidence that we can present at trial to prove this, but we are convinced of it. So I, I, what is the solution to, to, to this? Is it, is it putting everybody on trial in a criminal court in the United States? Is that, is that what we should be doing here? I mean, I think, you know, we have to go back to first principles here, it's innocent until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent. And certainly, if the U.S. government has been holding on to someone for over 11 years and they still can't make a case against that person, then that person should be released. And that's just a basic principle that's recognized by any civilized society. And when you look at Guantanamo and you look at the fact that there were, in 2003, almost 800 prisoners there, and now we're down to 166, that alone tells you that the rhetoric that was put out there by the Bush administration, that these men are the worst of the worst, was false. And that the Obama administration has done a very very poor job of undoing that rhetorical harm, undoing this myth of the threatening Guantanamo prisoner, and that unfortunately the Obama administration has not had the political backbone to uh, deliver on the promise that President Obama made when he was still a candidate to shut down that prison. And that's the only problem. It's not the National Defense Authorization Act. It's not um, any externally imposed hurdle. It's the fact that President Obama simply has not made this a priority, and he can very well close that prison if he really wanted to. He, he can, but you mentioned the, the political backbone to do it. And the reason I would say he doesn't have the political backbone is that even members of his own party haven't had his back. When he tried in 2009, when he first took office, and he tried to get funding to shut down Guantanamo, Republicans, you know, uh, were, were outraged about it. But it was Harry Reid, the leader, the Democratic leader in the Senate, who helped block that request for money. And I, I have the line Harry Reid said, Reid said firmly, we will never allow terrorists to be released into the U.S. And it, it just seems, it crosses party lines, that the fear of outraging the public by being seen as releasing terrorists. Well, and, and what you said earlier about the uh, the 86 who have been cleared, there with some of them there is a, a conditional aspect to, to that clearance. But what, what that means that they're cleared is that they have been evaluated to no longer be a national security risk to the United States if if transferred. And so I think that that's, that's very important to remember. And as far as Democrats and Obama being on the hook for that, I absolutely agree. I mean, it was it was Dianne Feinstein who was uh, very instrumental in getting the moratorium uh, on transfers to Yemen in place. And now, to her credit, I think she has reversed that position. But this is something that you see over the course of uh, Guantanamo Bay's life as it gets more and more of a bipartisan partisan glean, the public polls incredibly high uh, and disturbingly high. There's a, a 2012 poll that said that 70% uh, of those right. polled um, approved of Obama's decision to keep the prison open. I think that that, in terms of explaining things to the next generation, I think that that poll is going to be a very, very unpleasant poll to have to explain. Well, I, I think a lot of it depends on how the question is framed. And again, we, you know, we go back to the issue, but it is enormous. Uh, we, we have been uh, for decades, uh, the, more than a century, the most powerful nation on earth. We need to have the best informed uh, public on earth. If the question is framed as, uh, and I think in most people's minds, it would probably be, should we have uh, this uh, Guantanamo Bay in place to protect our nation, the great bastion of liberty and defender of all other free nations from harm, you know, people would say, well, yes, we should, because that's really the way it's been framed. There's pro there, it, there, there was some purpose that was served by its establishment. Uh, clearly, 11 years is a very long time to detain people with no trials. That's That sounds inherently unfair, and 86 people are being detained uh, apparently with uh, for no reason at this point. Is that... Well, you, yeah, so you, you, you were a member of Congress. I'm, I'm, I'm curious when you're confront, you were confronted with this, and, and you're, you're a former member of Congress now. We yeah. are asking you about it. Yeah. What what was your thinking? What would you like to see done in, in, in your mind? Well, uh, there's a protective. Uh, 
element that comes into play. So uh, what we don't want to happen, obviously, is if there's some uh, if there's some doubt about the potential dangerous nature of the remaining uh, detainees at Guantanamo, uh, then obviously the safety position is to say. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to change anything here until we're absolutely certain of what we're doing. So uh, that was a big part of uh, the decision making uh, on the behalf uh, on I, behalf of Congress. And, and uh, John, 